So in today's video, I take you to Chehanov. Now Chehanov is about 100 kilometers north of Warsaw. And this is perhaps its, its most famous aspect, the castle. So I'm going to talk a bit about the history of the castle, what you can see in the city. But to give you a very brief idea, this was the home of the Masovian Dukes. So during like the kind of earliest found foundations of Poland, uh, a number of the Dukes used to live in this castle. So it has quite a historical significance. Uh, they were fighting pagans, they were fighting Lithuanians, they were fighting Germans, everything has been fought from this castle. And I want to give a shout out to Wojciech. Uh, Wojciech is my first pa Patreon uh, you know, subscriber, so much appreciated. Thank you very much. So please join me on this journey of Chehanov, and I hope you find it interesting. Dzień dobry. Welcome to a Brit in Poland. This channel has a number of missions. The main one, to create a video for every place on this list. Though I could use your help. The help could be in a number of forms. You could like my video. You could subscribe to my channel. You could follow me on Facebook or Instagram, or you could donate to my Patronite account. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the video. So, as stated, Chehanov is about 100 kilometers north of Warsaw, and we took the train. This is uh, the rough route that we took through the city, so maybe we didn't see absolutely everything as a group, but we certainly saw the main highlights, you could say. And we came here in February, so, yeah, you can see there's a lot of snow on the ground. It's, you know, some would debate whether this is like the ideal time of year to come here. Um, because I imagine during the summer, it looks very green and a lot more beautiful. But snow has its beauty as well. So we had a bit of a trek from the train station. I, I don't know what it is about a lot of train stations in Poland, but they... Uh, especially for these kind of small, smaller cities, they tend to be right on the outskirts. So you always have a little bit of a trek uh, to get anywhere. But it wasn't that bad a walk, really. You know, um, it's, it's a well laid out city. So the first place we saw was a place called the Leaning or the Crooked Hall. And this was established in 1942, 1943, during the German occupation. So it was actually kind of like a headquarters of the, the Nazi regime here. And these days, it's more of a, an academic library. And the building used to be pink before they changed it to grey. So with Chehanov, I noticed, I mean, even with all the, the frozen uh, land around, that there were some rather beautiful places. So I imagine during the summer, this place must really look special. You have a lot of nice architecture dotted around and yeah, our first big monument, you could say, uh, you know, another monument to the fighters during the war. And Chehanov, um, it was actually, you know, it's been inhabited since ancient times, but uh, the first Slavic settlement appeared in the seventh century on the hill uh, of Farska Gura, which we will get to later and it was incorporated into the Polish state in the 10th century. But it wasn't to remain there. It would kind of flirt with independence a few times, and it would suffer numerous invasions uh, in the early period, uh, particularly from like Pomeranian and Prussian uh, armies that managed to destroy a large area of northern Masovia. The town hall, which we're just getting to now, uh, was built in uh, 1844 and is of a neo-Gothic style. And it's certainly one of those buildings that stands out on, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it definitely has some beauty to it. But you couldn't really go in there, so we trekked off to our first main site, which you would have seen in the introduction, which is the Castle of the Masovian Dukes. 
And so this was, let's say, originally a wooden stronghold built around the second half of the 14th century. And it was owned and occupied by the Pius dynasty. And it would remain occupied by them until 1526, but we're jumping ahead in the story. So the main function of the castle was defence. And it would defend against pagans, Lithuanians, Prussians, you name it. At some point, this castle probably had a fight against them. Uh, in the uh, 14th century, uh, the Teutonic Knights may have used cannonballs to attack the fortress. Um, so it suffered a fair bit of uh, wear over the years. But we'll go back to Conrad I, and he was the first Masovian duke and grandson of Boleslav III, who was the Polish ruler in the 12th and 13th century. And he would organize crusades against the pagan tribes. And he would invite the Teutonic Knights to help. However, they decided after this to have their own kind of land. And so they would kind of rebel and they would fight. Um, and there is a legend associated with this castle uh, saying that there is treasure guarded by a former ruler turned into a big black dog. Um, you also have other rulers such as uh, Siomovit III and he united the, the local regions through diplomacy and he was recognised as a sovereign by Casimir the Great. And he was likely responsible for the brick castle, which replaced the wooden stronghold. However, he has a bit of a dark history. He had his pregnant wife imprisoned, and she was then killed after the baby was born. Apparently, she was unfaithful. Uh, but this tale inspired Shakespeare to write a winter's tale. So, has not been lost to history. Uh, after him came Janusz I, and he again was fighting the Teutonic Knights who was imprisoned by them for a while and he was there at the Battle of Tannenberg uh, which was a very victorious battle against the Teutonic Knights. He's responsible for building the great house within the castle which housed the Duke's quarters, chapel and treasury. Next you had Siomovit IV who was his brother and he was someone who actually planned to occupy the royal throne of Krakow. Uh, he went there, found that it had already been passed down to Hedwig. Uh, so he decided he was going to marry Hedwig. However, the nobles of the city kind of stopped him from getting close. In the end, he gave up uh, his claim to the throne and married Alexandra. And he was given a nice bit of land as compensation. After him, you had uh, Boleslav IV, who was the grandson of Janusz I. He died... Um, after being attacked by a giant boar while he was out hunting. Uh, he had three sons. Uh, sorry, next he had uh, Comrade the, uh, the Red, sorry, who um, died in 1503, who had three sons. And these all died under various circumstances. Uh, you had Duke Stanislav, who died in Warsaw. Janus IV, who was strong as an ox, died in 1526 from drinking too much. And basically, uh, the land fell into the Kingdom of Poland as the dynasty of the Pius dies out. So the story, I, I've taken a little bit beyond the castle um, because, yeah, there's a lot of history of the castle, so we've wandered into the, uh, the city now. But I feel justified in extending the story because uh, the place where we're going next, which is the, uh, the museum of the Masovian Dukes didn't have a lot of information about the Masovian Dukes in it when we were there. Uh, that section was under renovation. Oh, this statue is of uh, St. Peter, who is holding, I'm assuming, the, uh, the key to heaven. And he's the patron saint of the city, as well as uh, being part of the, the city's coat of arms. But yes, so, carrying on the story. So... Basically, the castle kind of fell into decline um, once it uh, fell into uh, kind of Polish rule. 
And sadly, it was the site of, um, let's say, mass executions by the Nazis during World War II. Uh, the Nazis were said to have uh, killed off about 44% of the inhabitants of the city. And actually, Chehanov um, was a city who's, who suffered a lot of plagues and a lot of fires and things, as a lot of cities did, a lot of invasions. Um, and it was kind of revitalized by a, a Jewish presence um, of craftsmen and things, which, uh, and they were actually the largest kind of concentration of population in the city for a time. So it's had quite a varied history, you can say. And, yeah, there are lots of glimpses. I mean, in the museum here, you have all these kinds of cool uh, sculptures. There was an exhibit, temporary exhibit, uh, about um, the January uprising um, against the, uh, the Russian occupation, I think, in the 19th century. And, yeah, it was a bit of a small museum, but it was nice. Uh, we kind of overcrowded the place because we had a fairly large group with us. But you see all kinds of weapons and things that were used during the uh, the uprising, which was pretty cool. I always love good weapon. Uh, you had a bit of a room dedicated to the the kind of history of the uh, the Jewish presence here, as well, which uh, is kind of further signifying their importance uh, to the city. And yeah, so in the whole, not a bad day so far. So we carry on. Um, walking through and yeah we had did a fair bit of walking in the city you can say but our next target um, is uh, Fasca Gora and we'll get to that but I'm starting a little early because there's a bit to say so oh yeah sorry this was a cultural center and I had these like really cool like uh, statues outside the front I love it seeing random things like this I the kid in me just, uh, yeah, what can I say? Um, yeah, <laughs> they're just fun. So, and I always love, uh, the more uh, statues I see in the city, the, the more I love it, um, even if they are quite weird and quirky. But anyway, getting to Fascagora. So this is uh, basically where the original settlement uh, was established. It was moved closer to the site of the castle um, by Janusz I. So at the top you can see a certain bell tower that's actually dated back to 1889. Uh, but the main church, which was originally uh, the Church of St. Joseph, uh, uh, was built in the second half of the 14th century. But it was robbed and profaned much. In 1807, the French army devastated the building and actually turned it into a flower warehouse and bakery. And it was renovated then it suffered badly in World War II and was renovated again. Sadly, we couldn't get inside, uh, despite it being a Sunday with the various masses and things. Um, yeah, obviously the priest decided to take a break at the time <laughs> that we showed up. So um, sadly, yeah, we couldn't get in. And then you've got uh, John Paul II there with... Uh, some lovely scenic views behind him. Uh, this is a, a monastery uh, that was kind of across the road, which we, we didn't quite get to. But yeah, this is just giving you a nicer uh, view of the, the church. So This was a very, very thin house. Um, yeah, that, that was quite unusual. Uh, so this was uh, quite a famous bridge, and again, close to the foundation of the city, so... Historical. This was a, a nice park, which I'm sure in the summer looks absolutely amazing. Even in the winter, you can see that it's um, not a bad place to walk around. Random statue, which I didn't get close to enough to, to see who it was, but I'm sure that was a very important person. And I'm sure somebody in the comments will educate us on who that particular person is. This was absolutely brilliant. It's a labyrinth. Um, it's quite modern. I think it was uh, made up in uh, 2019. It's made of uh, Toya or Brabant. And this may be not the biggest thing, but it's fun to walk around. Uh, it's, it's pretty well constructed, so it is actually a labyrinth. You can take t wrong turnings. You can end up uh, having to double back on yourself. You can easily miss the kind of the central tree. Um, 
which looks more like a giant twig uh, at this time of year. But we had fun and yeah, it was just a nice little diversion. And I haven't seen anything else like this in Poland. I think there's a labyrinth in Krakow made of ice. And this steam locomotive uh, was actually uh, built in 2017. Uh, the model, I think, dates back to uh, 1948, this particular steam engine. And it was built as kind of a commemoration of the narrow gauge railway operations from, from the past. And the city's other big claim to fame is this water tower. And this was built in 1972. But it was kind of abandoned in the, the 80s. It actually stands at 143 meters tall, which is pretty impressive. Well, it's 143 meters above sea level. Whether that makes it that tall, I'm not sure. But attached to it is the uh, Taurus Science Center. So me and a couple of brave lads decided to explore this. And it's kind of attached to the, uh, the Copernicus Museum in Warsaw. So it's a similar concept, mainly for the kids or adults who perhaps just want to have a bit of fun and play around with different science experiments. So we were probably here for a good <laughs> half an hour to an hour just playing around um, with the various uh, little contraptions in here. And it was fun. It was honestly quite fun uh, to, to, you know, just play. It was only about 14 zloty or something to go inside. So, And when you have the place to yourself and you can just play around, it was, yeah, it was pretty cool. And they also sell Chahanov Monopoly. They will make a Monopoly board of anything these days, it would appear. And so we're getting towards the end of the day. So we went off and got some food and had, yeah, some lovely uh, sort of Polish staples here. And then after this, we were supposed to go to a bar uh, which is attached to the, the brewery here. But sadly, when we got there, this bar was closed. Apparently, when there aren't many tourists, i.e. during the winter, they decide that it's not really worth opening the bar. So we were very, very saddened and disappointed because this uh, Chehan beer is supposed to be very nice. But thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little snippet of uh, a small Polish town. Do zobaczenia!